Well, good morning everybody and happy Easter. It will be 16 days into the lockdown by the time you hear this and many things would have changed. They say this is the time of the unknown, the uncertain and the uncontrollable. The unknown, the uncertain and the uncontrollable. And so we have to lay hold of the anchor of our soul which is Jesus. And uh, on this Easter day where we celebrate around the world that He is risen, we want to bring that hope into your home right now. We're not just meeting as 3CR in Pretoria. We're meeting with the Rock Church in Durban, with Mark and Monique Nauman and those wonderful people, with uh, West Point Church in Kloof, with Brian and Caitlin Barnes and all their beautiful people, with Robin and Alette Buerta in Qatar, and the Doha Fellowship. How's it to all of you in the Middle East and to all the countries that you broadcast to? And uh, then to my mates, Harry and Wendy, and all the guys on the South Coast, at South Coast City, we're celebrating Easter with you guys today. Uh, sorry we can't be there on the South Coast with you, but we're thinking of you, we're praying for you. And uh, to Solid Ground in Middleburg, James and Vanessa Lennox and all their wonderful people. So we're not just doing church by ourselves, we're worshipping together with five or six other churches around the world. So I just want to say Happy Easter, uh, welcome to this time and let's enjoy worship together. To Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me, I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound. And drenched in tears They laid him down In Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed By heavy stone Messiah still And all alone Oh, praise the Break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, trample death. of white 
The blazing sun shall pierce the night And I will rise among the saints My gaze transfixed on Jesus' face
Good morning, happy Easter. Uh, very, very uncertain times in our world right now. Uh, uncontrollable. It's not uh, the rich can't control it. Twitter can't control it. It uh, doesn't seem like money can control it. And uh, so these are very uncertain times. And in my 25 years of being a pastor, this is the first time uh, that I don't have the privilege of preaching to people live on Easter Sunday. And uh, Easter Sunday is a day where we should all be interacting and celebrating Christ together. But Somehow God has given us the sanctity of our homes again and as families meet around the world and as this broadcast goes to the Rock and Durban and Solid Ground and West Point and Kloof, Solid Ground and Middleburg and Doha Fellowship in Qatar and obviously the people of 3CI and Pretoria, I just want to bring you much greeting and much hope. Uh, we are praying for you and uh, we are standing steadfast in this time that God is perfectly in control and that He will turn this around for the good. So don't panic. Uh, it is uncertain, but God is certain, and uh, He holds us in the palm of His hands. And uh, so let's read today from Matthew chapter 12, uh, unusual scripture for Easter Sunday, but I hopefully we can wrap it all up at the end. In Matthew chapter 12, it says, Then some of the Pharisees and the teachers of the Lord said to Him, Teacher, we want to see a miraculous sign from you. And I think everybody's looking for a sign at this time. He answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given to you except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh, will stand up at the judgment with this generation and, and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now one greater than Jonah is here. For those of you who know my preaching, say this with me. One greater than Jonah is here. Now we know that these stories have got something in common because Jesus uses them as a likeness, but we know they're very different in many regards. Jonah caused his own storm and got thrown into that storm and the storm settled down. We caused our storm with our sin and rebellion and Jesus willingly got thrown into that storm for that storm to settle down. But Jesus gets locked down a number of times. The first time he gets locked down is in his mother's womb and we don't know much about that, but the king of kings got confined into a woman's womb for nine months and uh, we don't know what happened in that place, but God was preparing the world for a savior. The second lockdown that Jesus has is in the desert. And in that lockdown, he encounters a number of things. He encounters the enemy. He encounters idolatry. All of this can be yours. He encounters himself and his own personality and his own emotions. And then finally, he encounters God. And we trusting in this lockdown that everybody will encounter God in some way. And then finally he has a lockdown in the tomb of which we don't know anything about other than the effects of that lockdown which was victory over death. And uh, we're trying at this time 
to remind people of the greatest lockdown that there ever was, was Jesus' wrestle with death, which he won on Easter Sunday. And you and I, wherever we are in our homes, can actually celebrate the fact that Jesus was victorious over that lockdown. But he does give us some insight into what the lockdown looked like for Jonah. And when Jonah came out of there, it says people repented at the preaching of Jonah. He only preached eight words. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overturned. Eight words. He spent three days in the belly of a fish. He went into Nineveh. Nineveh, the historians say, was like Baghdad, the capital of Iraq, with a very vicious and a very evil ruler. Now, if somebody said to me, uh, or God came to me and said, would you go and preach to Iraq? Would you go into the capital Baghdad and tell them to repent? I think I'd say I'd rather just stay at 3CI and preach to the people from Bronkospreit. It would just be much easier, more comfortable. And so Jonah, we all kind of think of him as a rebel, but God was asking him to do something very uncomfortable, which he wasn't really happy about. But then God locked him up for three days and he went through a process and came out with eight words. Imagine if we came out with eight words from this lockdown that completely turned the cities around that we live in. Durban, Kloof, Middleburg, Doha and Pretoria. Imagine if it got just eight words. I think of some eight word sermons that have affected my life. One was delivered by Angus Buchan. He said, gentlemen, it's time to make right with Jesus. It was a sermon that was preached when my dad, 72 years old, had come to listen to me preach, but Angus Buchan preached first. And that 72-year-old, successful, powerful, wonderful man turned to my friend Stan Phipps and said, what must I do, Stan? He said, you must respond, Mr. Dyer. And I remember my dad running to the front and giving his life to Jesus on eight words. Gentlemen, it's time to make right with Jesus. I don't know what your name is today, sir. Roy, Roger. Raymond, Paul, Peter, Benjamin, I don't know what it is, but Roy, Roger, Raymond, it's time to make right with Jesus. Maybe those eight words on this Easter Sunday can change you. Maybe those eight words by a rebel pastor like Jonah who decides to say yes to Jesus might be able to change your life in some way. Jesus said when he came out from the tomb, he said, woman, why are you crying? I want to just say this, lady, please leave your pain at the cross. That's a nice eight word sermon. What about the Lord's, my shepherd, I shall not want. What about the unbelievable declaration in Isaiah 61 where it says, This is the year of the Lord's favor. Now, I bet you don't feel like that right now. But, but we are a prophetic church declaring the prophecies and the goodnesses and the promises and the proclamations of God. And I believe eight words can change a nation, can change people's lives right now, friends. Eight words of Jonah. That's what Jesus said. The preaching of Jonah led 120,000 people to Christ. What about, friends, that you as a family or us as churches just come up with eight words that can radically impact our society in the same way that Jonah radically impacted Nineveh? I love the scripture in Ezekiel when God is talking to uh, Ezekiel to speak to the dry bones. And it just says this, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And there are many things that are dying right now. But I pray the dry bones will hear the word of the Lord at this time. Let's go and study Jonah and see from Jonah's lockdown just a few lessons that I believe we can learn. And some of the things that prepared him to speak those eight words. The first Easter message that led 120,000 people, an evil, violent, radical nation. Iraq, Baghdad, Saddam Hussein type people. They believed God, they believed the preaching, and they repented. I'm trusting, as men and women listen to this message, today you would repent and make right with God. Nothing else is certain at this time, but God is. Let's read Jonah chapter 2. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. His God. From inside the fish. Sometimes it takes us into lockdown before we actually start praying. In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. 
From the depths of the grave, I called for help and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I've been banished from your sight. Yet I will again look towards your holy temple. Just say that with me again, holy temple. Very strange thing in the middle of a fish's belly to be looking at. The engulfing waves threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. Probably some of you feel like that right now. Your thoughts have got seaweed all wrapped around them. I love the story. Uh, a number of years ago, maybe eight or nine, I was on holiday in Leisure Bay. Middle of winter, July, northeasterly pumping. That's what brings the seaweed onto the shore and brings the blue bottles in. Just absolutely shocking weather for the beach. But my family and I drove down to the beach and, and we saw two guys swimming. I mean, the sea was on its head. Seaweed everywhere, blue bottles, but two men swimming. And I said to my wife, they've got to be mad. So I walked onto the beach to see who on earth would be swimming. And lo and behold, it was two elders of 3CI. And um, I can't tell you their names, but um, the one guy's wife's name is Liesl and the other one is Yakumin. And I said, what on earth are you doing? They said, no, we're on holiday at the beach. We thought we've got to use the beach. But seaweed all around them, just very bad conditions. To the roots of the mountains I sank down and the earth beneath barred me in forever. But you brought my life up from the pits, O Lord, my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord. And my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. I think it's one of the key verses for this whole lockdown time. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. And so from this experience came eight words that changed the complete history of Nineveh. From this lockdown of ours, I pray God would give us words that would completely ch change the society that we find ourselves in. There's five things I want to speak about. Five things. Five things I want to speak about. The first one is the call or the cry. Jonah starts praying. And in, the, in the, uh, Genesis chapter 4 verse 26, when things go wrong with Cain and Abel, the Bible says, then men began to call on the name of the Lord. Do you know why I'm so encouraged for South Africa? Do you know why I'm so encouraged for Doha? Do you know why I'm so encouraged for our government? Do you know why I'm so encouraged for our economy? Because this is one of the first times in the history that our nation is actually calling out to God. We are crying out for the Savior to break in and to help us. We are on our knees eventually, at last, about time. And I want to say to every one of the churches, there are so many voices. There is so much news going around. There is so much fake news. There are so many brilliant preachers with unbelievable productions. The voices I would listen to now are the men and women who pray for me. And I want to say, friends, that for those at 3CI, we have an eldership team that pray for you, that cry out to God on your behalf. And for all the other churches that are listening today, the rock and solid ground, West Point and Doha Fellowship, I know that you've got leaders who pray. And every one of us needs to get on our knees at this time and cry out to God. I want to commend our president, Mr. Ramaphosa. I think he has led brilliantly through this time. But he has called this nation to pray. And I think one of the things that will save us and save our statistics, like all the other nations, will we'll be different to other nations, is because we've got men and women who will get on their knees and cry out to God. The second thing, friends, I read in Jonah is a confinement or a consumption with himself that is very dangerous. He says this many times. If I go through this text and you can go through it in your own time. My, I, me, I, my, my, me, me, I, 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 me, me, my, I, I, me, me, my, I, I. It's like he is completely consumed with himself. And this lockdown... 
I pray, will take us from the confinement and the confinement that Jonah found himself in. And then he makes this incredible declaration. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the word salvation, friends, both in the Old Testament, Yasa, and the New Testament, Sotira, both of them have got a meaning of spaciousness. God said, I will take you to a good and a spacious place, flowing with milk and honey. What happens with us, friends, is when we're left to our own devices, our egos, including mine, are so strong, we can even sanctify our egos and say we're doing things for God. But we are so consumed with I, me, and my, my house, my car, my church, my ministry, my portfolio, my everything. And, and what Jonah realizes that actually this sense of my has confined him into a very small space. And he makes the statement, salvation belongs to the Lord. And I pray at this time, friends, that we would be broken out of the confinement of our self-consumption. And realize actually there's a greater plan for our lives. We were not designed to glorify ourselves or to be the center of our own worlds. We were, glor we were created so that we could take the gospel of God to the ends of the earth, whatever line of work you're in. Salvation, the spacious place, belongs to the Lord. The third thing we see here is that he does a cost analysis. He's sitting in the bottom of a whale, plankton all around him, juices of his stomach, completely dark. He's got himself there and he starts thinking, he closes his eyes and the Bible says twice, he starts thinking about the holy temple. Think, my goodness, Jonah, what makes you think of that? The holy temple. And as you go into the temple, the first thing you would see is the altar of sacrifice. And that's where the animals get killed for. He said, Jonah has sinned. He's rebelled against God. He's run away. He's ended up in a very confined space. That's what sin does. It always makes your world small. And he starts thinking about the temple. And he will be thinking of the sacrifice and the blood that was shed for his sins. And he would start thinking about Jesus in the time ahead and the cost of, the, of what Jesus did at Easter time. He was killed so that we could be set free from our own confinement, from our own small worlds. And as he contemplates on the temple, this is what he says at the end of it. He says, but I with the song of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you. And so he does a cost analysis. He says, that blood was very costly. Now with thanksgiving... I will keep paying a price for you, Lord Jesus. Friends, the only way we can keep sacrificing for God, the only way that we can keep counting for God, the only way that we will keep giving to God and to His work and to His church is by thinking of the Holy Temple and by thinking of the sacrifice of Christ. We don't have people, we don't need people to gee us up and say, keep giving. No, just think about Jesus. Think about the temple. Think about the altar of sacrifice. And with thanksgiving, Jonah says, I will offer a sacrifice to you. I will keep counting the cost and I will keep paying the price. That's the message of Jonah at Easter time. The fourth thing, friends, and we're not going to go too much longer, just two more. The fourth thing is, is the word cling. He said, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. I learned an amazing lesson from one of my spiritual fathers, Chris Vinant. He put two microphone stands out like this. I was a young Christian and he was preaching on Abraham and God said to him, leave your father's country and go and lay hold of your new inheritance. And he held this microphone stand like this and he said, God will never let us hold two things at the same time. He said, you have to let go of one before you can lay hold of the other. And sometimes we have to let go of the good before we can lay hold of the best. And what has happened to Jonah is he's got a pretty successful ministry. He's got a pretty comfortable ministry and he's gripping onto this thing. And then while he's in the belly of the whale, he's kind of thinking, while I cling on to this, I'm losing something else. And so I'm praying 16 days into our lockdown that God is opening up the grip that we've got over idols. Privacy, freedom, finances, um, comfort zones, those things that we've grabbed so tightly. I pray God would release our grip. For those who cling to worthless idols, forfeit the grace that could be theirs, that we would lay hold at this time 
of what God really has for us, what God's really planned us for. So I pray there would be a letting go and a laying hold of. You won't be stuck between no man's land. You will grip hold of the things that God has for you and you will find his grace come upon you and his glory come upon you. The final thing, friends, when I look at this is that Jonah gets his courage back. It says this, what I have vowed, I will make good. And he's very scared to go to Nineveh, but now it seems like he's got his courage back and he wants to go into Nineveh. And I pray at this time, friends, that we get our courage back. And the Bible says the word of God came a second time to Jonah. And I pray the word of God would come a second time to you, sir. The word of God would come a second time to you, ma'am, a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time, a sixth time, because God is so gracious that you would find the courage at this time, at lockdown time, you would find the courage just for eight words to do what God has called you to do and to make a difference in Nineveh or in Kloof or in Doha or in Middleburg or in Pretoria or wherever it is that God has called you to make a difference. Eight words changed Nineveh's life. But the Bible says, friends, that Jesus is greater than Jonah. Jesus is greater than Jonah. So I was looking at Jesus post lockdown and I realized he didn't need eight words he only needed four and I want to share those four words with you and so I'm not sure if the sermon is called the eight word sermon or the four word sermon but let's have a look at John chapter 20 on the evening so after Jesus has broken out of the lockdown of his tomb on the evening of the first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, the disciples were on lockdown, the same as we are in South Africa, and probably right now in Doha too, and whoever's listening to this, you'll be on lockdown. Behind locked doors for fear of the Jews, for fear of the coronavirus, for fear of the future, for fear of catching some bug that nobody's got control over. With the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you four words peace be with you in verse 26 it says a week later his disciples were in the house again and thomas was with them though the doors were locked still under lockdown jesus came and stood among them and said peace be with you that greek word is irene we've got a whole suburb in Pretoria, named after Irene, named after the Easter message of Christ. Greek people call their daughters Irene, named after the Easter message of Christ. Irene means divine favor. It means wellness. It means wholeness. It means tranquility. It means prosperity. It means flourishing. It means every kind of good. It means blessing. And so while we are part of an uncertain, unknown, uncontrollable environment, the Easter message to you is peace be with you. Irene, be with you. Tranquility, be with you. Wholeness, be with you. Prosperity, be with you. Blessing, be with you. Wholeness, be with you. Health, be with you. Friends, I implore you come up with eight words or come up with four words but this is not the time for the church to be scared god is perfectly in control everything seems to be out of control but god is perfectly in control god is our father and god will look after us and on this easter day is a day that we celebrate the breaking of the greatest lockdown of death and we ask for that courage to come into your home at this time let's pray Heavenly Father, I thank you for the preaching of Jonah. Eight words, Lord God. Eight words that changed the whole city, Lord God. And the Bible says those men will be in heaven with us. I pray for eight words, Father God, to change families' lives right now. Give them eight words from John, eight words from Psalms. Eight words, Lord God, from the Exodus. Clint said this, 
Lift up your staff, stretch out your hand. Stephen said this, call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Daleen said, by God's amazing grace, there is much hope. In 2 Corinthians 8, it says that you through his poverty might become rich. The Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. Lord God, I pray those eight words would ring over every home, Middleburg and Kloof and Durban and Doha and Pretoria. I pray they would ring over the homes of Irene, Lord God. And I pray Irene would ring over the homes of every single family watching this. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Let God's peace come into your house right now. Right now. Peace of God. Peace of Jesus. Peace of the cross. Peace of Easter. Come over your people now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Eight Word Sermon. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Eight Word Sermon. Ephesians 3, 20 to 21. He can do immeasurably more than we imagine. Eight Word Sermon. I am the way, the truth, the life. Eight Word Sermon. John 16, 33 says, But take heart. I have overcome the world. God bless. Eight word sermon. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Much love from Doha. Uh, Isaiah 61. This is the year of the Lord's favor. It might not seem like it. It might seem completely opposite to it. But these are the eight words that I want to proclaim over our churches. This is the year of the Lord's favor. It is a proclamation I'll make in Jesus' name. Amen.